Why do people with similar backgrounds often react to the same experience in dramatically different ways? Why are some of us resilient to stress while others fall apart in the face of adversity? Why is it that some people are consistently positive while others wallow in negativity? Neuroscientist Richard J. Davidson has spent much of his career trying to answer these questions. He has discovered that we're all composed of six emotional styles. Emotional styles. He's been able to trace these styles to patterns of neural activity. That's the crucial link. A new book, The Emotional Life of Your Brain, considers how these patterns affect the way we live and other strategies to change them. Joining me now are the book's authors, Richard J. Davidson. He's a professor of psychology and psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Sharon Begley is a science editor at Reuters. I am pleased to have both of them at this table. This is a continuation of our series, which we call Brain Watch, uh, as we look often at the extraordinary developments in understanding the brain as the most exciting frontier of human insight. So welcome. Thank you so I much. Said that. Welcome. Tell me about uh, what it is that you have discovered and this connection between emotional style and being able to see it uh, in terms of neural activity. Well, first, one of the most salient characteristics of emotion is that people respond to life's slings and arrows in different yeah. ways. Some people decompensate quickly in response to stress, and other people appear to be much more resilient. And from very early on in my career, those are the issues that really captured my attention and my interest. And uh, it was clear that in order to gain a better understanding of these emotional styles, we needed to look inside the brain because the brain is, after all, the organ of behavior. It is where uh, our emotions are ultimately generated. Uh, and so the search began with looking for patterns of activity that are associated with some of those variations among people in how they respond now, to This them. has been your lifeline, <clears throat> your, your professional life's primary preoccupation. It has. Why? Well, it always, it, it just struck me from early on that uh, how people respond to uh, these kinds of challenges was the key to understanding why different people are, are different in their unique personalities, mm -hmm. why some people may be vulnerable to certain psychiatric illnesses, and why people may even show a propensity for certain kinds of physical illnesses where stress seems to be an important ingredient in exacerbating. And what did your experience with the Dalai Lama teach you? My experience with the Dalai Lama taught me the, the central message is that emotional styles can change. Mm, so there's plasticity here. That's right. Okay, so uh, let's define the difference in emotional style and emotional traits and, and other things that are not emotional style, which is the subject of your focus. Well, uh, emo we, we define... Uh, what's a mood, what's a trait, what's style? Okay, so uh, there are uh, a set of terms. Uh, a mood can be uh, thought of as uh, a pattern of emotion that persists for uh, minutes or hours. Uh, a trait uh, is something that can persist for a very long, ta very long term, uh, but a trait uh, is different from an emotional style because the emotional styles that we describe come directly from neuro neuroscientific mm -hmm. research. Personality traits, which are commonly studied traits, predated our understanding of the brain. They are traits like introversion and extroversion, uh, those are, uh, or neuroticism. Those are traits that emerged very early on in psychology's history before we really had a deeper understanding of the brain. The six styles that we describe come directly from neuroscientific research. I didn't decide one day that uh, I would think about uh, mm. the styles that characterize our emotional repertoire, but these really emerged over the course of 30 years of work. And where do you come into this, Sharon? Well, I've covered Richie's research for a number of years, and I did a book earlier on neuroplasticity, and the last chapter of that book was Richie. Um, mm. That book documented the uh, very hard-won revolution in neuroscience, as you've mm. talked about with Eric Kandel, um, namely the discovery that, in fact, the brain structure and function is not set in stone from the ripe old age of three, but in fact can change radically depending on the, the life we lead. Depending on every experience you have. Exactly. You know. and, and just define for us neuroplasticity because it's a term that we are, the, the people like me throw around. Right. Um, it, it simply means the ability of the brain 
especially the to adult brain, to change its structure and function in response to experience, in response to the life you lead. Part of the, what you have discovered, part of the argument you make is in terms of an emotion can be located in a different part of the brain than we normally assume emotion comes from. Yeah, <clears throat> yes, that's very true. Uh, the prefrontal cortex <clears throat> is an area of the brain that is among the most recent to develop over the course of evolution. Uh, this is an area that many scientists consider to be very critical for the highest level right, of right. human thought. Right. Uh, and yet it also seems... Not emotion, but thought. But thought. But it also, based upon our work and now the work of many other scientists, uh, it seems to be intimately involved in emotion as well as thought. Mm. And it's a place where thought and emotion seem to come together. Uh, and so there are complicated decisions that we make in life, which are decisions that actually are benefited by emotion. Uh, decisions mm. such as whether we should marry a particular person or not, or uh, yeah. uh, those kinds of life decisions are not decisions that are made based upon a cold cognitive calculus. They are decisions that are made when we appeal to our emotions, and the prefrontal cortex plays a very important yeah. role in that. I now remember what the Dalai Lama said to you, <clears throat> I think. He basically said you focus on compassion. He did. Uh, he, when I first met him in 1992, he said, look, you guys have been using the tools of modern neuroscience to study fear, anxiety, sadness, yeah. depression. How about these positive qualities like exactly. compassion? Exactly. And, and I didn't have a good answer other than that it was hard. But, you know, it was hard when we first began to study fear as well. Yeah. You, he, he lists here, and you would know them as well as he would, the six dimensions that comprise an emotional style. Yeah, um, and a lot of them are quite intuitive. Um, one is resilience, um, mm. the ability to bounce back from a setback. That's an emotional style. It is. Right. Um, outlook, whether you are essentially positive or negative. Half in your, half empty. In, exactly, in how you think the future will play out. Um, Self-awareness. Um, we all know people who are very much in tune to how fast their heart is beating, whether mm. they're perspiring, etc. And other people are completely oblivious. And being aware of your bodily signals is an aspect of emotional style. Um, uh, social intuition. Um, being able to look into someone's eyes, to read their faces, to figure out what they're thinking. Something that uh, children and adults who fall along the autism spectrum are very, very, uh, have a great mm. deal of trouble with. I can tell the mood of people when they sit at the table then you would rate high on mm. social I, intuition. And low on somewhere there else, you but, but there you go. Um, another one, uh, perhaps surprisingly, is attention. Um, but Richie has shown that whether you are able to focus, um, and sort of the opposite of that, how wide, how broad your attentional receptivity is, those are all aspects or feed into emotion as well. We all know that when we are emotionally stressed, we're not very good at paying attention. And what I like about this work is that all of these things are physically real. I mean, personality is sort of a human construct, mm. but these are things that are, you know, you see them on the fMRI, you see them on the EEG readout, right, right. and because they are so real, they lend themselves to being changed. And there's also this, you can change your emotional style as you, as you live your life. Absolutely, and, and emotional styles are being wittingly or unwittingly affected by our experience, and one of the uh, aspirations of this book is that people can actually take more responsibility for their own brain by more intentionally cultivating um, experiences that uh, set them on a positive trajectory. And you can see the change in the brain, in the you, imagery of the brain. Uh, absolutely, you, you can. And so we've done studies, for example, with specific interventions that are designed to promote certain ne emotional styles. Has the neuroscience community accepted this? Uh, I think that uh, you know we've published the work in in, in really first-rate neuroscience journals. Uh, uh, our research on meditation has come out uh, in the in in in, in very high-profile journals, and in many cases, it was the first time articles on meditation have ever appeared in these hard-nosed neuroscience mm -hmm. journals. So I would say that it is beginning to be much more um, uh, the the environment is beginning to be much more receptive. Uh, and that is because we are providing hard-nosed evidence and mechanisms. And I think that the changes um, and, and developments in modern neuroscience have helped tremendously because neuroplasticity uh, is probably uh, the greatest insight of neuroscience over the last decade uh, in terms of uh, sort of general themes. One of the things he suggests is that delayed gratification, uh, if you can practice that, then you can develop a higher sense of well-being. 
Yeah, and you've just put your finger on one of the important aspects of this, um, the six elements of emotional style. When you say them, resilience, it sort of right. sounds like everybody wants to be right. more resilient. You say outlook, well, everybody wants to have a more positive right. outlook. Right. But in fact, um, if you are too far at the extreme of any of these dimensions, you might have a problem. And for instance, just to pick your example, if you have an exceedingly positive outlook, then you can, for instance, look at that piece of cheesecake and tell yourself, well, I can eat that and then I'll, you know, spend more hours at the gym. Everything will turn out fine. So people who have a very positive outlook are bad at delayed gratification because they can't tell themselves that, hold on, maybe that will not turn out very well. So the interesting thing about Richie's work on emotional styles, especially the part about how you can intervene to change them, is that there's no ideal place along any of these dimensions. You have to know yourself and figure out whether you want to move, you know, toward one extreme or the other. Thank you very much. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Sharon. Good to see you again. Thank you so much. Good. Appreciate Thank you for joining us. See you next time. Thank you.